Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. Today we're going to take a look at the Epiphone Jared James Nichols Outfit Signature Guitar. This was actually a personal gift from the man himself to me. And no, it's not just a publicity stunt for Gibson because of the whole play authentic thing. This was in the works way before that. So once again, thank you, Jared, for sending me this guitar. But let's go ahead and do an in-depth review and learn a little bit more about this really cool model. So if you're not familiar with Jared, he is an American blues rock player. He's got a really nice lively playing style and an infectious stage presence to him. He makes playing the guitar look really fun, essentially, and he's got a really good story behind him of how he first started playing guitar around the age of 15, and it's just been hard work and practice that got him to where he is today. But recently, he partnered up with Epiphone to release a signature lineup of guitars that he calls the Old Glory Les Paul Custom. Now, these things are $699 new, so no, they're not your cheap Epiphones, and it's most closely similar to the 1955 Les Paul Custom outfit. Except for, well, we've only got one P90 here. It's a wrap tail piece instead of a stop tail, and a few other differences we'll talk about here. And these things are made in China. However, what I really appreciate as a spec is you have a American Seymour Duncan P90 in here. In my limited experience with Epiphone, my favorite ones are always ones that have American electronics in them. I did a review of that Epiphone Snow Falcon, the signature guitar of Brendan Small, and that thing blew me away at how good it was. It was to the point where I questioned, did that thing actually have better specs than the Gibson version? So even if you're a little bit scared away that this is an Epiphone signature instead of the Gibson signature, hear me out on this one. This is still kind of a pretty cool guitar. But just a little bit of a backstory behind why this guitar looks the way it does. He kind of really got into that whole single pickup guitar thing, and he was looking for a Les Paul Custom that just had that single pickup. While he was on tour with Leonard Skinner, he ended up finding one of those on Reverb for like a ridiculously cheap price, but he still had to use his girlfriend's credit card to pay for it. You can check out that whole story over on the Mark Agnesi show. But he essentially modded that one up, drilled it out for the wrap tail piece, and then he put a plaque over the stop tail piece stud so they wouldn't be showing. But from his modded Gibson version, Epiphone also sent him a couple of guitars that he could do whatever he wanted with. And he kind of just ended up with this layout, except for that prototype has just a bunch of random holes in it from stuff that he didn't want anymore. It's kind of cool to see the first two old glories side by side. But on top of this Epiphone offering, he also has the Blackstar JJN amp, which I haven't actually got to try one of those out, but they sound pretty cool. I would like to. And hey, if you happen to be in the market for a new guitar and a new amp, if you head on over to Sweetwater's website, they have this exclusive deal where if you buy the guitar and his amp, they'll almost give you $400 off. So now that we've got some of the history behind this model, let's go ahead and get my first impressions here. Now, if you're new to the channel, you just happen to check in for this video, I primarily review high-end Gibson, so I'm a little bit snobby when it comes to some of the finer details in life. But here's what I thought first thing pulling this out of the case. Jeez, this is a really fat, chunky neck. This, I hate to say it, it might actually be a downside for some players that have the smaller hands, but I mean, when you're over six feet tall like me, yeah, it's no problem, but it is a very huge chunky neck. So just keep that in mind when you're buying it. And at the same time, the, the frets aren't like super tall or anything, but they're nice and wide, which is really good for doing bends. And seeing as how like, you know, two step bends are like his thing and just a bunch of bending in general, I can definitely see why he has this fret wire on there. The next thing is the way this guitar feels. It looks really cool in the photos as well as in camera here, doesn't it? But it's like a semi-gloss finish. I know in my unboxing I called it like a matte finish, but the more I felt it, the more I was like, mm, no, not quite a matte finish because you don't feel the wood grain and it's just slightly smoother in feel compared to that. The only downside to this is it is very prone 
to fingerprints. <laughs> It'll just start showing and it kind of looks ugly very quick, but it also shows you how much you played it. Now, luckily, unlike with a gloss finish, you can just do this real quick and then it's all gone. So. But I like that because the guitar just kind of naturally rubs against you. It's not super sticky or anything. The neck has that same finish. It's rather fast feeling. So as a player, I actually prefer this type of finish over the full gloss. However, I think if you really sat down and went to town with this on like a polishing kit, I think you could definitely buff it into a gloss. And the next thing is this thing's just visually striking. The one pickup Les Paul Custom and other higher end versions that aren't juniors, for whatever reason, I dig the vibe of these things. And I think more and more people are now too. But as I was hinting at earlier, there's some aspects to this that point to a bunch of other vintage things that I really dig. So first off, again, this is a Les Paul Custom 50s inspired back when they had two P90s, except for instead of having the soap bar cover and the Alnico 5 in the neck, he just has like the Les Paul Jr. style dog-eared P90 as well as the wrap tail piece. So that's two 50s models kind of blended in together here. But what a lot of people don't realize is this actually has some arch top vibes to it. I had to uh, text Jared. It's like, hey, why is there only seven inlays on this thing? And then he responded, I was looking at guitars like this one. He sent me a photo of an Epiphone Emperor. And he's like, it just looked cool on that guitar. And when we mocked it up on the Les Paul Custom, he also liked it. But another high-end arch top feature is the stinger on the back of the headstock. Now, sure, you can find this on other things outside of the arch toppian world, but that's kind of where they originated from in Gibson history. And I had a lot of comments in my unboxing video that I hate Epiphone headstocks, but it works with this guitar for some reason. And I think it's because of the whole arch top thing. The seven inlays, it's just throwing you off from this looking like a regular Les Paul Custom. And it just makes all this work. That's my theory anyways. But another kind of cool thing about the uh, headstock stinger is when you're looking at this guitar while you're playing, it almost looks like the headstock is double bound. Hey Jared, if you're watching this, I would love to see like a limited edition white top. Still keep the black back and sides. That is actually reminiscent of a very rare Les Paul custom from the 70s. I call them the tuxedo customs. I think it would tie in really well with your white stinger. Limited edition it, you know, maybe if Gibson ever gives you your signature guitar, do a black and white finish. <laughs> and then the last thing, we kind of already briefly touched upon this, his whole blues power mantra. This is how he lives his life. Originally back in the 50s, like you would normally see this on like a 335 styled instrument. When they would do a factory Bigsby, or if somebody was modding it out, they would use these to cover the stop bar tailpiece holes. And they would say custom made, so people would be like, oh, wow, super fancy. <laughs> so we kind of borrowed that little cool feature. So that's why I think this guitar is kind of cool. And I probably would have reviewed one of these anyways, even if Jared didn't send me this. To be honest, it was kind of hard waiting for it because it's like, oh man, I want to review this model so bad. <laughs> so let's go ahead, throw this on the workbench and learn a little bit more about its specs. Looking the gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> Feels wrong, but it's part of my show. So the P90 pickup here, it is American made. It's a Seymour Duncan P90 and it is the model SP91B. These things run about a hundred bucks new, 60 bucks used. So, I mean, it's definitely a respectable pickup in here with the vintage style braided wiring. The pickup reads 9.3K ohms in the circuit. They call it a dog ear because it has these triangles on the outside and then the mounting brackets are right here. But you could also choose to mount this with a soap bar cover and then the mounting screws go through these holes right here. So for whatever reason, you hate dog ears, you wanted to cut those off. I mean, you could technically still mount it with a soap bar style. And just to mock that up here real quick with a different Gibson one, this is what it'd look like. It seems like the route is slightly larger, so you would still have some evidence if you wanted to switch to this style. And you would have to drill it directly into the wood and add some springs or foam. But that kind of has a cool look to it as well. You could also do a mini humbucker in here. Inside the control cavity, this is kind of interesting. It says LP Custom Old Glory EB for Ebony. If you scan that, I bet it'll take you to like the Epiphone page of this guitar. And I bet that should match the serial number. 
which appears to be the case. Can't re-neck Epiphones and get away with it anymore. But here's what's cool about this of being a 50s Les Paul Custom is it's actually just, you know, a mahogany body. So this does not have the maple top that you would find in a modern day custom. So that's another cool little uh, throwback feature here. The wraparound style does have the intonation lightning bolt right here. The back just says Epiphone on it. You adjust the intonation with these screws. It just kind of slides back and forth like this. Now, the big feature here. I don't think we're going to see stop bar studs down here. Yeah, I think it'd be really cool if they had those there. And then you could switch this between a stop bar to pneumatic versus the wrap tail bridge. And they just give you a custom bridge that'll fit in those same holes. I think that'd be a cool feature on like a newer version of this guitar. Because, you know, sometimes you like options. Then you've got your single volume and single tone layout. Now, I was always kind of questioning why he went for that design. And now that I know a little bit more about the history of how he modified existing guitars, I kind of understand why he did it like this. Because if you remember my Kazuyoshi Saito Les Paul review video, I kind of talked about this. Usually with a one pickup Les Paul Custom, you'll either see this configuration or you'll see it in the junior configuration, which is kind of like he's in line with each other, but kind of more towards the middle but since his original old glory kind of came from the gibson standpoint that had this layout i bet he just never even thought of doing the junior style and by now that's just what he's used to so we'll probably always keep it like that but if you're put off by not having a neck pickup you can really do a lot just messing with the volume controls and the tone controls but it definitely takes some time to hone your skills there so moving on from there again it's just a solid mahogany body there there's no weight relief or anything. That's something else you know about these. They're pretty heavy. And you do have an ebony fretboard with, again, only these seven fret inlays. It's got a little bit of oil residue I haven't wiped off yet. But these are the acrylic plastic inlays. I mean, they're not fancy or anything, but they look nice. And then you have a formed plastic nut. The truss rod cover has three screws. And this is like one of the only QC issues that I'm even going to talk about is this thing is rather rough looking. There's a lot of like chatter lines along here. I think they could have smoothed those out a little bit, but I mean, if all you have to complain about a guitar is the truss rod cover, <laughs> I think they're doing a pretty good job of building them. Then your headstock here, you've got your custom inlay and the Epiphone branding. I get a 1.68 inch nut width, which increases to 2.06 at the 12th. Now the moment of truth, how chunky is this chunky neck? Surprising, 0.89 at the first. That doesn't sound too crazy, but it's a super rounded neck profile. There we go, 1.07 at the 12th. That kind of helps you show how rounded this neck is. Honestly, when I play it, it almost feels skinnier in the higher registers than it does at the first fret. I don't know why, but that's just how it felt to me. And it looks like they're going for a 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length. Just in case you're curious what it looks like all strung up without the plaque on it, this is what it'll be like. You'll have two small holes there. I know not everybody gets the blues power thing. I kind of thought it was cheesy at first as well. But hey, I'm the guy that calls my followers troglodytes. People be like, hey, don't you know that's an insult? No, it just means somebody that's deliberately old fashioned or ignorant, which is just a perfect way to describe guitar lovers in general, because anything past 1959, people just don't like it. Other small finish blemishes. I notice on the binding, it's kind of kind of a botched colored up here. You kind of see that the color was kind of scraped away on the edge here. I mean, these are very small, minor cosmetic blemishes, but hey, if we're going over it with a fine tooth comb, that's what we're gonna do. Here's a slightly better look at what I was talking about right there of how they kind of scraped the binding a little bit too much. But a kind of a cool little feature right here is they did do the thin binding in the cutaway. No maple cap to expose this time, though. Beautiful top carve on these, though. Not like a super belly or anything, but it really does reflect off the light pretty well. Now we'll move on to the back. Your store-bought one won't have a custom inscription to you by the man himself. That's something special for me. But the control cavity right here is actually kind of cool because it's the regular one. So if you wanted to add two additional knobs and a neck pickup, you could. And it's kind of funny that, you know, I've learned that there's some uh, arch top aspects to this guitar because I was thinking, what if I add a floating neck mini humbucker like one of those jazz guitars? Because then I could just add those little controls in here, somehow find a way to do the wiring and whatnot. And I thought that was kind of cool that I actually do have the option to do that. 
but the pots themselves say made in Korea, 500k. And something that's kind of interesting here, when they did the route job for the output jack, you can see they went a little bit too far with their little drill bit. Kind of got into the body of the guitar. I don't know, maybe that's just what they do for all of them, but that lines up perfectly. But while we're on the sides, you have a plastic jack plate and just your regular style Epiphone strap buttons. The other one's right here at the top. Now Jared gave a few of these to other people as well. One of them was Robert Baker. I recently collaborated with him. Poor guy, his signature got all wiped off because just playing the thing. But he wasn't too sad because he'll say, I'll just have him sign it again when I see him next. I'm sure one day you'll see like a collaborative effort between the three of us. Because he recently just moved to Nashville, which isn't too far from the Ohio guitar guys. So huge, big C neck profile here as we were talking about earlier. And the Stinger, I want to talk about the Stinger a little bit. Since this is such a flat, vintage gloss finish, as they call it, you can actually feel a visible line between the black finish and the white finish. It almost feels like a sticker. Like, can you hear my nail rub against it? Now, you don't notice that while playing, but I thought, hey, it's worthwhile mentioning. But what I like about this is you do have Grover tuners on here. That's pretty nice. And the serial number of this one is 19, so 2019 model 04152618. I don't believe it. It only weighs 8 pounds, 2.2 ounces, but it feels like a 10 pound guitar. I'm not sure what's going on here. The weight distribution must be off. It must be body heavy. But let's go ahead, plug it in, and see how it sounds when an average Joe plays it. this guitar and how it sounds, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Would I ultimately recommend this guitar? Yes, but with some reservations. This thing's cool enough, it's got some really nice special features that I think it's worth owning. However, is it the best bang for your buck if you're comparison shopping between used and new models? No, I mean, it's 700 bucks. You can get yourself a very nice used Les Paul Studio with a nice gloss finish, things like that. That'll probably do you better if you're just buying your first guitar. So is this first guitar material? Yeah, maybe not. Unless you're really into Jared James Nichols and it inspires you like that. However, even though it might not be first guitar material, I think this is definitely next guitar material because it inspires you to play differently. If you're mainly a pick player, this thing will make you go, huh, maybe I should try that finger picking stuff. It inspired me to do a bunch of big bends, or at least try to anyways. So it's a very cool and inspirational guitar in that aspect, so I think it goes great within a large collection of guitars. Yeah, since you only have that one pickup, yeah, sure, you can dial in some different tones with your volume and tone controls, but I think if it's your only guitar, you might get kind of bored with that. Fit and finish wise, I didn't really notice much with this guitar that I would consider, you know, QC issues. We looked at a few areas on the bench, but how well does it stay in tune for a guitar that you really have to bend the crap out of the notes to sound like the guy who this is for? I was surprised just how good it was. It wasn't perfect. I mean, I'm constantly tweaking this thing, but I'm, you know, trying to do like full two-step bends up here and it's only coming back, I would say about four cents flat or so. But I think with a new nut on here, maybe just a few other setup tweaks, this actually was very impressive to play. 
the only other small critique I have is I noticed that the frets are already starting to show some wear and I've only been playing this thing uh, maybe about five hours. I kind of noticed that with most Epiphone guitars though. I mean, it's not like huge divots, but you can start to see where the frets have been, you know, kind of scratched against the strings. I think it just comes down to the type of material that Epiphone uses because I've never worn through frets on a Gibson, but this is my very first uh, like real official Epiphone. I had a special two before this, but even this one still has that same phenomenon where even I can wear through the frets a little bit. So if you dig the looks and you dig the vibe of this guitar, definitely check one out. I had a great time and you know, I got it for free. So of course I like it. Let's go ahead and take a look at it under black light. I highly doubt Jared would send me a repaired guitar, but you can see the binding does this really cool glowing thing. So I think this would look pretty cool on stage. Maybe Jared can use this in his next concert or something. Yeah, pretty cool here. And back of the headstock, got your stinger there and your stickers are glowing. I want to remove those stickers because I think they look tacky, but at the same time, it's like, that's part of the original vibe of the guitar. I hate dilemmas like that. So no surprises here, but it's always fun to look at these under black light anyways. Let's take a look at the case. Now the case is kind of cool here. They call it the Epi Light case. So it's like a mixture between a gig bag and a hard case. Like it really does feel like there's wood inside of here, but I think it's just like a really firm plastic strip. That would be my guess, but I haven't ripped one of these things open. But we've got shock absorbers on the bottom. But the inside of the case looks like this. It's got a little bit of padding to the top, pretty decent padding to the bottom, good padding on the sides, kind of like a hard foam. Then they've got this kind of cheesy looking uh, heel rest right here, but it works. And then a single neck rest with a, uh, a strap right here. So it's very similar to the Gibson soft cases that I wrestled with in this video. But I would say these are probably almost a little bit better, but it definitely has that I was made in China smell to it. You can see he personalized it to me right there as well. But you're probably wondering, huh, where's your case compartment lid at? Well, it's on the outside. You've got the zippered pouch. So it would be pretty easy to fit like some pedals in here as well. But you do get some case candy with these. You get a Grover hang tag, you get a guaranteed tag, you get your truss rod adjustment tool. And these actually do have a certificate of authenticity. Now they look very similar to the Gibson version, right? But mm, there's a certain quality to this that isn't quite the same as the Gibson version. And it looks like I have a matching serial number there. And on top of that, you also get the Epiphone owner's manual. That looks pretty cool. A giant Epiphone sticker. You can probably put that on your case. And this giant poster. So if you think you might be interested in being the next owner of the custom signed Jared James Nichols Old Glory given to me personally, you can check out that list. Yeah, just kidding, guys. It's just not right. Even if I didn't like this guitar, I don't think I could sell it because, you know, a personal gift is a personal gift. You can't sell that. All right. Thank you, Troglodytes, for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Follow Jared on Instagram and his future endeavors. He didn't tell me I had to make a video about this, but I decided, you know, it's good click enticing stuff right here. All right. Take care.